Okay, why don't we get started? The February meeting of the Long Island Railroad, Long Island Bus Committee. Are there any public speakers? Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you. I expect to be back next month. The we were expecting you to be back this month. I, I'm not the governor. <laughs> it's before him as we speak, so... And I guess when he, get back, when he gets back in town, he'll sign the bill. Um, I just want, I want to speak briefly about the um, monthly operating report, especially on-time performance. I talked about how the, the Long Island Communities Council is very interested in looking at the numbers from more of a passenger perspective. And actually, uh, the staff at the PCAC did a very, um, I'm not going to get into the details, a nice report weighting uh, the delays by hours lost by passengers, and even as a branch by branch. So I want to, I'm not going to go through it now. I just want to make you aware that we did that. I'm going to give that to the, to our committee and, of course, to the railroad. Um, you can take a look at it and help, help us out about looking at what causes the most delays for people as opposed to for trains. I mean, we have a, there's a large number for its total for, for January, for instance, total lost days when we, amount of time and you added it all up, is 4,355 hours, which is significant. I think I think that's what passengers are feeling. I know there was a debate about uh, we, we we face it a lot. A lot of passengers think that the statistics the railroad shows does not accurately reflect their experiences. So we want to try to improve the credibility of the railroad and try to say what's really going on out there. The other thing I want to note is regarding um, paratransit. I mean, we hear about declining ridership, and that's one area both on Long Island and in the city where we see dramatic increases in ridership. In fact, I know in Nassau I noticed how there's such a dramatic, much more than ever expected, and I don't, it'd be good to hear an explanation of that. And who should fund it is, is a problem we're facing. I know we want to do some reductions and only do ADA trips, but I think that's, that's probably the wrong way to go. But I think maybe we have to rely on our government partners to fund ADA service. I mean, increasing mobility of disabled people is certainly a worthwhile goal. And I know everybody here supports it, but I think we're going to have to ask for someone to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. And we look forward to you once again joining us at the table next month. We all hope so in that regard. And the, the issue of the ADA funding is obviously part and parcel of the public hearings, which will be held next Monday in Nassau County and next the following Monday in Riverhead in Suffolk County as part of the MTA public hearing schedule. So we would encourage everyone to come out and uh, inform the board as to their views on the service reductions and other budget balancing issues that are affecting MTA. Um, we have the minutes of January 25th. Second, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Okay, Long Island Bus. Joe. Hey, good afternoon. Overall, this December bus performance was strong. AM and PM weekday pullouts were both 100% for the month of December 2009 and above 99.9% .9 for the previous 12 months. Completed trips were above 99% for both December and the previous 12 months. MDBF was 3766 double from its levels of 2008. My hats are off to my people. They did a great job in that area. The 12-month average MDBF is 32% higher than it was a year ago. In regard to safety performance, our 12-month rate for bus collision per million miles is higher from the 2008 levels due to the inclusion of hit-and-run accidents. They weren't counted in the 2008 numbers, now we're counting them in the 2009 numbers. 12-month uh, rate for employee on-duty lost time accidents worsened by 12.1 percent from the same level, from the same uh, 2008 level. Uh, primary bus ridership results continue to trend downward for fixed route service. Total fixed right, uh, route ridership decreased by 4.2% for the month of December. For the 12-month period, total ridership was down 5.9% in 2009 as compared to 2008. Weekday ridership was down 3.6% for the month of December and 56 for the 12-month period. Weekend ridership was down 1.8% for the month of December and down 4.7% for the 12-month period. Uh, paratransit ridership was, was slightly off for the month of December, 0.3%. But, but for the 12-month period, paratransit ridership increased by 4.4%. May, maybe, Tom, you could come up and give a little explanation on the uh, 
the increase in the uh, for the whole year on paratransit. On paratransit. Good afternoon. The uh, increase in uh, paratransit is the uh, result of improved service. We have an on-time performance that's increasing. Uh, we finished January at 97%. Our uh, complaint ratio of, uh, for boardings has declined. We have a fairly new fleet. Uh, we've introduced uh, some sedans as well. And so on all fronts, the performance is uh, improving, and customers tend to see that reliability and take uh, more trips. Do we know in your records, are there new customers or old customers taking more trips or a combination of both? Yes, it's usually the uh, incumbent customers, the old customers. I don't mean it that way, but it, it, right. existing customers, existing customers. Existing customers will take uh, more trips as they see the service and the reliability and get used to how to reserve trips and the schedule accordingly. And the, and the introduction of the sedans, which I know is something we talked about at length in the committee a number of months ago, has proven to be very successful? Yeah. Yes. Yes, very successful. Good. It's going to save us a lot of money at the end of the day. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Preliminary financial results show that the fixed route fare box revenue was $40.1 million or one6 better than a final estimate. Uh, paratransit fare box revenue was better than the final estimate by 5.7 percent. Actual for 2009, actual non-reimbursable expenses before non-cash adjustments were lower than the final estimate by $9 million or 6.9 percent. This month's Long Island bus financial report inclu includes a preliminary review of 2009 financial results, a complete analysis of results will be included in the April agenda in accordance with our work plan. We have no action items or ratification for the month, but we do have three non-competitive procurements and one competitive uh, co procurement for the com committee's approval. The first non-competitive item is a sole source one-time parts purchase contract to Cubic for various parts required for the Cubic fare box collection system on fixed route buses. The total amount of the contract is not to exceed 80000 the second non-competitive item, I don't know how you want me to go over Keep going, three. yes. The second non-competitive item is a one-year sole source miscellaneous purchase contract to ACS for software and hardware ma maintenance services in support of Long Island Bus's ACS orbital CAD AVL system. The total amount of the contract is not to exceed $322,000. The last competitive item is a one-year sole source miscellaneous purchase contract to Ultimedia USA to provide preventive and emergency maintenance services upgrades uh, for software and system support for communications equipment and uh, systems furnished by Ultimedia and located. This is for a, a Mineola Intermodal Transportation Center. It's not to exceed $43,218. I request the committee's approval for these three non-competitive procurements. I move them. Second, any questions? All in favor? Aye. The competitive item is a water service contract at Union County seating to repair or rebuild 170 bus operator seats on fixed route buses. The total is not to exceed 85000 for a term up to two years. I move it. Second, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Okay. We have one service change to report. Norm Silverman will come up and uh, talk about the service change. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's a very minor service change on Route N24, which is the Jericho Turnpike to Mitchell Field, Roosevelt Field Carter. And during the weekdays, we have a one of the branches of that route. There are two branches, one that goes um, to the EAB Plaza, or the former EAB Plaza, the RXR building on Hempstead Turnpike, and the other branch goes to the Charles Lindbergh, 60 Charles Lindbergh County facility. Um, the branch to Charles Lindbergh, currently right now double loops it doesn't lay over in the facility but goes in and comes back and comes back again and we're eliminating that double looping by simply laying over or terminating at 60 Charles Lindbergh 
Um, we've already spoken to the proprietor or the manager of that facility. There's no problem there. The loop that's used by the buses is used exclusively by buses, so we're going to use it as a layover point. Saves us a little money, provides a little more direct service, and that money will be used to fund a schedule revision on the entire N24 seven-day-a-week service that we're going to be putting in um, in the uh, pending spring service changes. Any questions? Thank you very much. We're going to do this change in April of, uh, April of the spring pick. Okay. The final item in this month's agenda is, a, is the financial reports for the committee's information in accordance with the committee work plan and the MTA's annual budget process. The report includes the 2009 final estimate and the 2010 adopted budget and the fi February financial plan for 2010 to 2013. These are all in your package. Uh, the adopted budget includes any gap closing actions and pegs in the baseline. These were presented below the line in November financial plan by, that was adopted by the board. That concludes my remarks. Any questions on the financial plan? Okay. 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 Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Joe. Helena? Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start with um, our financial report. The work plan items are contained in the information section, and I'll be doing those. Um, Mark Young has the financial report. I'll cover the uh, adopted budget issues. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good page, afternoon. Go, good yeah. afternoon. That's right. That's right. We're on our uh, different. <laughs> The uh, the book uh, uh, includes in the in the financial section the uh, first document shows the final uh, final figures for 2009. Um, to summarize, the um, on the revenue side we collected 731 million dollars in revenue. Um, that was five million dollars favorable to the final forecast, which was positive, um, despite the fact we were down 3.4 million versus the final forecast in um, in Fairbox revenue, which obviously was related to the ridership trends we saw in 2009. On the expense side, uh, we uh, showed expend expenditures of 1.7 billion dollars, which was just a modest 2.4 percent increase over 2008. In fact, if you look at payroll on the payroll side, uh, a few notable points. Overtime spending was down 2.8 percent compared to 2008, um, and but unfortunately, pension costs, which are largely out of our control, uh, went up 15.8 percent. They're based on actuarial assumptions. On the non-payroll side, we spent 329 million dollars, which was down 3.5 percent versus 2008. The year-end fare box ratio was 43.9 percent. Um, the uh, we do have, as I usually report, we have preliminary numbers for ridership for the first month of 2010. Uh, we're still seeing the same uh, trends that we had seen in the prior year. January 2010 uh, ridership total was down 3.5 percent versus January 2009. And if you compare that over a two-year period, it's down 12 percent since January 2008. So uh, we continue to see declines, obviously, in ridership. Commutation was down 6.5 percent versus January 2009, a 6.2 percent drop in monthlies. Um, but we see, continue to see growth on non-commutation. We need to look at that. It, we, it was up 1.2 percent uh, versus January 2009, and we did see that at the end of 2009 as well. Towards the end of the year, we started seeing growth in non-commutation. So uh, we'll, we'll keep, uh, keep watching that figure. I will say, though, in, in wrap-up, that despite the fact we were down 3.5 percent in ridership in January 2010, we did beat our budget estimate uh, uh, slightly. So that's a positive, at least from the financial perspective. And that concludes the financial report. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And we're going to go to um, our uh, uh, status of operations, Ray Kenny. Well, good afternoon, everyone. The uh, operating report starts on page number uh, 27 of our book. And um, the month-to-date on-time performance for January is 96.85 percent, which is a new all-time record for any month for the uh, 31 years that we've been keeping these consistent records. Uh, the January AM off-peak, uh, I'm sorry, the January AM on-time performance was 96.55. That's a new record for January. January's PM peak on-time performance was 96.18. 
and January's off-peak on-time performance was 97.02. Uh, during the month, we had six rush hours um, at 100%, two in the morning, four in the evening. Car availability was met each day. Uh, the MBDF is lagged. Uh, we're reporting on December. Uh, the total MBDF was 141,863, and the MBDF goal was exceeded for the M3, C3, DE, DM, and total diesel fleet. The one significant event affecting performance that we had was on January 15th, which was the an Amtrak train becoming disabled in one of the East River tunnels during the PM rush hour, uh, resulting in a total of 72 late trains. Uh, during that event, we were assisted by the MTA police in providing crowd control and also as, um, supervision at our movement bureau. Uh, that concludes the report, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Any questions of Ray? Okay. Okay, and speaking of MTA police, we're going to move to our police report. Good afternoon. The crime report is located on page 46 of the Long Island Railroad book. And as you can see by the report that we are down 21% in our reportable felonies for the month of January. And as Ray had mentioned, during the uh, service disruption, we assigned officers to transportation in Penn Station and at the Movement Bureau to coordinate with transportation for crowd control issues. And if there's any questions, we're happy to answer them. Any questions on the report? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, and Kevin Tomlinson with the um, Capital Program Report. Good afternoon. Um, our Capital Program highlights are found in Section 5 on page 49 and include one milestone for the month of January. We achieved the beneficial use of platform lighting at Bayshore, Bayshore Station. Uh, the standard project updates for the centralized police facility, Atlantic Avenue Viaduct Phase 2A, East Side Access, Babylon Train Wash, and the Mainline Corridor Improvements Projects are found on page 50. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer, answer them. Any questions on capital program? Okay. Thank you. And with regard to our information items, if you turn to um, uh, page 53 in the book, we have a summary on our um, schedule changes um, for track work, um, and that's for the period March 8th through May 16th, um, and it represents various construction projects where we'll be doing installation of mechanized ties, um, surface um, a, a surfacing work on switches. Uh, I did want to point out, just so there is no confusion, um, we will be going to hourly service on the Port Washington branch, but this is not to be confused with the service reduction proposal um, that's uh, scheduled for September based on, you know, the process we're going through now. Um, if you have any questions on that staff summary, I'd be happy to answer them. And I want to thank the uh, railroad for adding the additional service to Mastic, Shirley, and Spionk passenger service. Both are, I know that has been something that has been uh, very much requested over the years, and I'm glad to see that we can finally be able to do that in that regard. That's very helpful. Very good. Thank you for noting that. That is um, a no-cost opportunity to add service um, that customers have asked for. Good. Um, we have. Yes. <laughs> Since the train is already going there. <laughs> right. Occasionally we get to do something uh, right. that works out well. Um, we also have included um, adopted budget information. Um, it's contained in the book, um, and it reflects uh, the year-end summary um, and the financial plan for uh, 2010. Of course, as you know, that really reflects the um, budget actions that were taken uh, by the MTA board in December uh, to balance the budget at that time. Since then, our financial information um, has continued to degrade, so there will be um, forthcoming, I think, more changes to our budget. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn now to um, our PTC presentation, and that was a handout. Um, I just want to ask you for a moment to um, take a look at that um, little handout with me. <clears throat> Again, as background, and this is an item that I think um, both of you have heard us talk about uh, in the past when we retained um, consultants as well as an overview at um, CPAC. Uh, but again, just as background, on October 16, 2008, uh, the Rail Safety Improvement Act was passed. Um, that was an unfunded federal mandate uh, requiring us to provide positive train control 
Uh, and this is designed to prevent train-to-train -train collisions, overspeed derailments, incursions into established work zones, and the movement of train through a switch in the wrong position. Um, PTC design on page three, you'll see, will be based on Amtrak's Access 2 design, uh, which is an overlay to the cab signal system. Um, I want to note that um, Access 2 is being grandfathered by the FRA uh, for approval, um, and given the time constraints based on implementation and um, completion by um, uh, 2015, uh, we don't have the opportunity to really examine other alternatives. Uh, and that is, you know, one of the constraints um, under this unfunded federal mandate. If the time should be lengthened, the question would become, you know, are there other alternatives that the industry would come forward with? But right now we're very focused on um, acquiring access to. As we note, this is an overlay that works extremely well with the cab signal system. Um, one of the issues Long Island Railroad faces is that um, we only have about 65% of our system with a cab signal system. Uh, and as you will see on the next page, um, that cab signal system is, you know, denoted with automatic speed control in yellow. Uh, the rest of the system does not have that level of um, uh, safety that's already existing with um, automatic speed control and cab signaling. We would have to install um, track circuits uh, in the other areas because PTC works as an overlay on that system. So you can see um, how many miles of track we have to cover uh, with track circuits, which makes this a very expensive proposal for Long Island Railroad. I would note that Metro North has um, uh, perhaps 85 percent of their system covered by cab signaling. If you turn to page five, um, you can see um, estimated costs associated with this. Phase one is the PTC implementation plan. We need to file by April of this year a plan that outlines how we're going to comply. That's got to be filed with um, the FRA. Phase two is really a design of the PT system, how we're going to cover um, the design issues we need for um, an early start on the procurement, and then phase three is the actual uh, buy the um, overlay system and install it. Um, as you can see, these costs are actually slightly less than numbers we've talked about in the past because we would be seeking to install, seeking to obtain a limited use exemption um, where we would not have to install PTC from Ronkonkoma to Greenport uh, based on the level of service being provided. On page six, um, you can see the PTC um, milestone um, schedule. It's very aggressive um, and requires us uh, to cover a tremendous amount of territory with what is essentially um, a new technology. And again, I want to emphasize an unfunded federal mandate that will have an impact on what we can do in our own capital program now as we have to fund this. I would um, also note that because of the investments that the railroads, um, Metro North and Long Island Railroad, have made in centralized um, uh, central automatic train control and cab signaling, we did send in a comment um, under the um, uh, notice of um, proposed rulemaking by the uh, FRA um, to ask that they define um, uh, automatic uh, train control and cab signaling as an accepted method of positive train control. Uh, they've taken the position previously, you know, that they did not accept that as sufficient for stopping a train. We recognize that it doesn't stop a train, but that it adds a level of safety in high density areas um, that we believe is um, sufficient. We're asking them to consider it. Um, my sense is that, uh, you know, they may not change uh, their perspective, but we'll at least be on record as this issue um, continues to move uh, perhaps from FRA back to the uh, legislature in uh, Washington. If you have any questions on PTC and our approach, I'd be happy to answer those. We're, we're not asking because of our service levels between um, Spionk and Montauk, 
we're not asking for an exemption there under the assumption that we wouldn't get one even if we asked for it. That's correct because of the volume of traffic, traffic and the number there. of customers. Right. So we're just asking for it between Ron Conkomer and Greenport. Correct. Separate and apart from the issue of the service reduction issue. It is separate and apart, however, the service reduction certainly um, further supports right. the exclusion. Right. We would ask for the exclusion anyway, um, but it is certainly supported even further by the limited number of trains we'd be operating. And the cost to do it from Ron Conkerman to Greenport, if we had to do it? If we had to do it um, and we had to bring it up, um, Al? It's about uh, $75 million. To bring it up to the standard that would be necessary if we did not get an exemption. Right, because we'd have to put in the track circuits and then put uh, PTC overlaid on top of that. Neither of which we have there at the moment. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, we'll um, move to the procurement. Okay. Um, there are two procurements in this month's package, totaling $7 million. There is one item in the non-competitive section in the amount of $6.7 million and one item in the competitive section. With regard to the non-competitive item, it involves um, uh, our use of uh, Loran uh, maintenance of way equipment, uh, and this is a rail vac machine. We request um, a vote on this item. Any questions on this? And do you move it? I move them. Okay. All in favor, aye. And then there's one. Are you doing one at a time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, These and are different pieces. Go ahead. One item in the competitive section, uh, and that is a miscellaneous service amount of um, 302740 it's for cesspool service, um, where we disposal yeah. of wastewater um, at the Ronkonkoma train wash facility. And we ask for a vote on that item. Second. All in favor? And if Suffolk County had sewers there, we wouldn't have to spend the money. <laughs> Although They actually, may get sewers there. <laughs> even with sewers, they ask us to do. I know. Uh, they I know. always ask but, us with of course. train wash facilities of to course. do some extra. Um, but we'd like them to get sewers out yes. there for a number of reasons. Wouldn't we like to? Yes. <laughs> um, there are no ratifications in this month's package. Okay. And we also have an inventory report. And um, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Otherwise, mm -hmm. that's our report. Any other comments? Questions from anyone? Okay. We would once again uh, urge everyone to attend the hearings March 1st in Nassau County and March 8th in Suffolk County on the uh, proposed 2010 budget and the service adjustments that will uh, pertain there too. And we would uh, hope everybody will do that and we look forward to seeing everybody back here at the March meeting. Most meeting adjourned. Thank you.